that you guys came, a lot of things are happening around. So uh, very happy to see all of you. Thanks for coming. My name is Karl Martin Farby. I'm a um, program curator here at uh, the Kunsthub. Uh, and I'm uh, honored and really, really happy uh, to uh, have these uh, people here tonight who are going to be uh, teaching us and inspiring us with lots of new and fascinating ideas. First off, we're going to have um, Anita Akwasade Solbu. Um, she will do a short presentation around uh, 20 to 30 minutes. After that, we'll be joined by Dr. Denise uh, Ferreira da Silva. Uh, she'll be joining us online from uh, New York, I think. Um, and uh, she'll be doing a, pre a presentation as well. And then after that, there'll be a Q&A uh, with uh, Susanne Winterling. And of course, this event is also being done uh, in the context of Susanne Winterling's exhibition that we're showing downstairs. So we turned it on, so hopefully maybe after the talk, uh, or if there might be a short break, but I think it, that you won't really have time for that then. But afterwards, we can keep open a little bit longer if you guys want to, uh, to see the exhibition downstairs. Can everybody hear? Great. Then uh, let's get started. Anita. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, nice. I can also hear myself. <laughs> okay, for, first of all, thank you so much, Susanne, and the amazing team at Kunsthal for giving me this opportunity to talk about something that I'm very passionate about. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Anita. I'm a researcher and PhD student at NTNU. I have a background in chemistry and my PhD is in biotechnology and during my education I've had the chance to work with some imaging techniques and uh, I've always been curious about other <laughs> methods of imaging techniques so I've been reading about it and I would like to present to you um, some of the imaging technologies that are happening in science now because I think this is an insanely big creative field that has a lot of potential to act as a a fabulous uh, intersection between art and science. Um, since there are so many methods, it's really difficult to put it into one category. So I think I want to start the talk by explaining what is light and what is seen um, in terms of light. <laughs> So this is Richard Feynman, he's one of my favorite physicists. Uh, he has this uh, really nice example. He says, imagine if you were sitting by a swimming pool and someone dives in and there will be waves uh, forming on top of the water and um, then there will be more people diving in and there will be a choppiness of waves forming. And if there will be an insect that can be by the pool looking at these waves that by any chance it can have sufficient cleverness that interpret this data, these waves, the patterns, uh, and uh, with this way it can understand what happened, when it happened, where it happened. And that is what basically what we are doing when we're seeing. There is a lot of information around us because we're constantly in a swimming pool full of light and waves. Um, and the, the insect is actually our eyes, uh, that's the detector. But the difference between reality and the swimming pool is that in, uh, in reality the waves are everywhere, they're going in three dimensions, but in the swimming pool it's on, on the surface of the swimming pool and it's in 2D. And uh, the position of the detector matters because if I'm standing here and someone's to the right and to the left, I don't see them but they see each other because the information between them exists, but not between me and them. So this is, um, it's very important uh, to consider that light has a wave-like characteristics and it's the visible light is actually a very, very small part of this whole spectrum. And it goes from like very short wavelengths from the left and high frequencies 
of gamma rays, X rays, ultraviolet, visible light, infrared, microwave, and radio waves. And all of these parts of light has different applications in the imaging technologies that we will get into some of the crazy examples. Um, the other thing that I find a bit uh, fascinating is that we live in an era of information that we have, we carry this feeling that we know stuff and uh, we're always bombarded with like images in different forms. Um, but I find that in science, uh, imaging is more of an explorative tool rather than documentation. And usually the images that are taken are um, useful in terms of further measurements or further analysis. And there are times that you don't even know what you are seeing, so you have to make sense of it all. Um, and uh, this is just microscopy examples, and because microscopy is very important into, in the study of uh, the building blocks of life and uh, to understand health and disease. Uh, I find this really three uh, nice pictures that I find quite different from each other. These are live kidney cells um, that uh, they're taken every... Live means that they're pictures that are taken every three seconds and put into a video. And uh, these are the ovary cells of hamster moving around. And uh, this will give us information, for example, if you have cancer cells, how cancer cells move, how they spread, and uh, yeah, stuff like that. And this is uh, the intestines of a canine. Uh, so the difference is that that's like deep into the tissue. It's not really on the surface. Uh, but it shows the versatility of microscopy. And one thing is important that when you look at an image like this, you have to understand that there is targeting and stacking that is happening. And what I mean by that is that there are certain molecules called fluorophores. You have definitely, most probably heard of fluorescence. And these molecules have the capability to get excited by a certain light. So if you give them like uh, high energy light, they get really excited and they go to this excited states. And from there, they are they have different movements. They can vibrate or rotate and go to the first excited state and then they can emit light. So they get a high energy light and then they emit a lower energy light. And these molecules have a certain chemistry that can be targeted towards a certain place. For example, if a cell is made of a nucleus, cytoplasm and a membrane. This is a membrane, this is a cytoplasm and that's a nucleus. And we have to use three different fluorophores that can be excited by different lights and can emit different lights. And these lights should not overlap each other. And then when you are imaging the same plane, you have, to, you have a certain light and you have to change the light to the next and the next. And then you put these images together to get something like that. So you can imagine what's going on with these <laughs> images. And this um, stacking can be done on the same uh, height, or Z, as we call it, or it can be done on top of each other. <coughs> that leads to 3D stacking. Um, if you get an image and then go to the next height, and the next height, and the next height. And if you want to have a colorful image that is in 3D, you have to change the light again and do this whole 3D image again. This is the 3D image of a zebrafish brain. Just wanted to show how brain imaging looks like because we will talk about it in later in this talk. And the image processing in a 3D is different than in 2D because pixels in 3D have a volume. It's called a voxel. And these voxels um, can be uh, uh, can become more accurate. Like there are mathematical models that can detect signal and noise and change the signal to noise ratio. So this is a picture from our master's thesis, and that is exactly this image. It's just that um, that mathematical formula has been used to make the image higher resolution. And why does this matter? It's because 
uh, the image processing is different. You cannot use like a Photoshop. It has to be, it has to make sense. You have to prove that all these things that you're applying to an image is scientifically correct. Uh, and this is used in a really crazy way called thought imaging. They get a brain fMRI um, and they get these 3D images of the brain. And they have seen that when they show different pictures to, the, to people, they get uh, different activities in the brain, in the front lobe of the brain. And the brain is like a very dense structure, as you've seen, but they use some modeling that inflates these pictures and then they flatten it. And they can then reconstruct what people are seeing. For example, uh, they present a clip and then they can reconstruct the signals from the brain into what they're seeing. This is a study from 10 years ago, so this has uh, really uh, improved a lot and probably got its way into Black Mirror episode. <laughs> so they're showing, and you can see that when it's a, a simple structure, it's quite accurate what they can reconstruct from a brain image, or if it's a face, but when it's like uh, a writing or letters, it gets much more weird. Yeah. And then another, um, the next imaging technique that I find quite uh, fascinating is that uh, we don't need light to produce an image all the time. We can do imaging uh, by materials approaching each other. There is this um, chemistry behind two molecules approaching each other that they can start feeling each other and they create a force, force curve. Uh, it's called atomic force microscopy and there will be a sharp object that we assume it's one molecule, it's not. You can never make something sharp enough. <laughs> but it, go, it scans the whole uh, surface and it creates an image that can tell us simultaneously how something looks like and how its properties looks like. So it will become something like this. Uh, it gives us, this is a hydrogel, uh, it's 90, made of 90% water, so it's like a very wobbly structure that has never been managed to um, be imaged. Uh, they had to like dry it to make it stable enough to be imaged. Uh, but uh, this method gives high resolution image of how the surface structure looks like and how the stiffness looks like. Like the uh, this brighter parts are like very stiff parts and the uh, darker parts are softer. So you can image properties of something. You don't have to image how something looks like. Uh, and we go to the third um, imaging technique that is uh, another crazy field by itself. Uh, so in astrophysics, which is literally a new window to the universe, they use uh, very different parts of this spectrum. For example, in the Hubble Deep Field, uh, it's mainly using visible light. And if um, there is this woman called Natasha Walker, uh, which I will present her work in the next slide. But she has this example that if you're standing somewhere and there is an ambulance coming, you start to hear the ambulance voice in a very high pitch. And then when the ambulance is going away, the waves, like, you start to hear it lower. So the signals get uh, lower. And lower signals present, a, present red. And uh, it's called redshift. So when you're looking at a Hubble deep field image, the universe is expanding, everything is moving away from everything. And then when you're looking at the microscope, you can see colors at first, and then everything is going away. So you start to see everything in red. And this is just a visible light. Um, 
and you know that the James Webb images are using the infrared part of the wave. But the short wavelengths have also been used to in high energy astrophysics, like they can image neutron stars that are spinning so fast around themselves and around each other. But the craziest picture, in my humble opinion, <laughs> uh, of these things is that the Hubble image is like a patch of the sky. It's like the size of your thumb of the sky. Um, but uh, Natasha Walker in, in, in Australia, they have made, the, they have found this field that they could, that was like quite deserted from any signals. And then they decided to use the radio wave, which is like the lowest, high, uh, like longest wavelength of light. And then they managed to get an image of the entire southern sky. So this is how it looks like. And uh, the colors in this image are not attributed. It actually gives information about the distance. Um, and they have been very surprised to find this super bright light in the middle. They thought that this is a stardust. It's not. It's like electrons being uh, uh, like a, it's a synchrotron radiation because electrons move around the cosmetic magnetic field. And this using the radio telescope and ra radio astronomy has the potential to image the first stars ever because uh, when the Big Bang happened, there was 300,000 years that it was like a soup and it was like very full of dust and light cannot get into the dust and this the radio waves can penetrate the dust. But, uh, and then it was full of hydrogen and the hydrogen got charged and when the hydrogen got charged and the stars, the first stars, stars got formed, uh, they can be imaged by this uh, radio waves. But there is another, uh, to, yeah, there is another way to do this imaging, which is called the gravitational wave detection. Uh, the Big Bang itself also <laughs> is there is a possibility to image it because you can use this method that does not even. Uh, use light at all is that if you have like a blanket and you throw a watermelon at it, it uh, shifts the space it is in. So heavy objects when they're moving around, they can like very heavy objects because this is a very low uh, coefficient. Like it has a really low coefficient. So if two black holes are colliding, they create a ripple in the space time, and they are detected by this gravitational wave that they create around themselves. It has, no light is used. And this is a method that spiders use actually, to detect and see. Um, spiders make this web, and then they go around the web, and if something hits the web, they know how it has deformed the web and what has happened. Um, yeah, and this method has the potential to observe the Big Bang. As a summary, uh, I think the takeaway message is that we should really move beyond what we think an image is and uh, we should know that we can manipulate and uh, think outside the box and use all the information around us because the information around the, it's not just light, it's light, it's heat, it's uh, the detector is the media between the detector. I just talked about light today. There is so much that can be manipulated. And it's important to know that even light is limited. And also I think uh, it's so interesting to think about how animals see. Because their brains are different, they process data differently. Some animals feel and detect, they see by detecting electronic fields. So it's really interesting to like dig into what an image is to an animal. And thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I had to do this. This is the latest uh, image of the James Webb uh, telescope. Uh, she's a symbol of her probably revolution. <laughs>
and thank you for your attention.